And uh, welcome, if I have not said welcome to you yet, uh, to UMFK and to our Rural U faculty retreat. I'm uh, very excited today to introduce our keynote speaker. And um, her name is Dr. Mara Casey Teichen. Teichen, sorry. She's an, uh, an assistant professor of education at Bates College in Lewiston. Um, her research focuses on racial and educational equity in rural schools and communities. Her book, and I'm going to hold it up, I won't miss your page, I promise. Her book, Why Rural Schools Matter, um, is an ethnographic study of two rural southern communities examine, and it examines how rural schools define and sustain their surrounding communities. She is currently working on a multi-year project supported by a grant from the Spencer Foundation that explores the college aspirations, transitions, and persistence of, ru of rural first-generation students. Based on that description, you can see why I invited her as our keynote. It absolutely fits perfectly what we're doing today. Mara also studies community organizing for education reform and works with the Annenberg Institute for School Reform, where she supports organizing efforts in rural New England. Mara is the 2016 recipient of the Lighten Award for Scholarship for the Scholarship of Engagement for Early Career Faculty. Before receiving her doctorate from the Harvard Graduate School of Education, Mara taught elementary school in rural Tennessee. Please uh, help me in welcoming Mara to you. Okay, can you all hear me okay? Yes. Great. Um, it's wonderful to meet you. It's wonderful to be here. I really appreciate the warm welcome um, and being able to spend some time with you today. Um, as Scott mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about my research in rural Arkansas today um, and talk about why rural schools do matter. Um, and then at the end, connect it to your practice here in, um, in rural Maine. Um, so, but before I begin, I want to start you where I started. And this was as a third grade teacher in rural Tennessee, rural Van Leer, Tennessee. Um, and I moved there in my early 20s, my very early 20s. And I was new to teaching. I was new to life in a rural community. Um, I was new to Van Leer. And immediately, um, from the very first fundraiser, Beans and Green Supper, I began to see how this community would turn out for the school. Um, and so the night of the fundraiser supper, this entire playground here was completely covered with cars. Um, the highway to and from the school was completely lined with cars on both sides. Um, in the side of the school cafeteria, it was completely packed with people. Um, and there were students, and there were families, and parents, and cousins, and aunts and uncles, alumni, little old ladies living in town. And everybody had turned out um, for the chance to be able to see one another, to be able to catch up a little bit, and to support the school. Um, and this is something that I would see again and again and again. Um, how people would really turn out for the school, whether it was a Christmas concert in the gym, um, whether it was a um, you know town meeting in the school library, uh, whether it was to fight to save the school from closure. Um, the threat of consolidation was always there. Um, so people would turn out again and again and again to, to fight to save the school and to support it. Um, I saw other things too. Um, the demographics of the school were pretty unmistakable. It was almost entirely white. Um, and it was a very poor community. And I could see how sometimes the poorest families and the few families and students of color were made to feel unwelcome in the school. Um, and um, also, I was teaching a very particular policy context. It was right after No Child Left Behind in the past. Um, and there was this kind of anxiety that sort of floated through the halls um, around test scores. Um, and like I mentioned, too, the consolidation. So there was this anxiety that kind of um, sort of fueled uh, how people were feeling about the school and factored into worries about the future. And what I was really seeing was this very particular kind of relationship between rural school and rural community. Um, how the school was a source of relationships and supported the community socially. Um, perhaps how it might have factored into its demographics. How it might have perpetuated those in some ways. Um, and also how it factored into worries about the future. So this is where I became interested in this question of like why and how rural schools matter. Um, and that's what I'm going to talk a little bit more about today. Um, and so I'm going to share a little bit of background, um, talk about kind of the rural school relationship, school community relationship historically, um, and then I'm going to go deeper into my findings, and I'll talk about Delight and rural Arkansas separately, then a few lessons across uh, both of them, and then um, finish up talking about Maine um, and how this might relate to your own uh, practice here. Um, so oftentimes, uh, the first thing I get asked when I talk about my research is, what is rural? Um, and it's usually an urban audience that's asking me this, but I'll, <laughs> I'll give you a little bit of background here. Um, as you might know, rural is a pretty contested uh, concept. The federal government uses more than 20 different definitions to define rural. Um, so there really is no one accepted definition. Um, 
The definitions all tend to be pretty problematic, one, that there's so many of them. Um, they also tend to be pretty broad, and so rural is like kind of a coarse sort of category. Um, in my opinion, the biggest issue with these definitions is that in almost all of them, rural is the default category. So it's kind of like whatever urban or metropolitan is not. Um, a lot of people push back on these definitions and think that it's more useful to think about rural as kind of um, an identity um, and sort of a way of being about ties to place. Um, and that's, I kind of fall more into that second camp as well. Um, despite all the confusion about what rural really is, um, there are a few things to say about who and where. Um, so using the census definitions, um, there's about 51, uh, rural, 51 million rural residents. Um, and as you can see the demographics there, um, it's about uh, 80, close to 80% white, about 8% African American, 9% Hispanic. Um, and these uh, demographics are changing um, quite rapidly in rural areas. Um, so the white population is going down, um, the communities of color are increasing. Um, as you can see, the, um, pink, the, the pink dots there are non-metropolitan counties. Um, so rural covers a vast area. Um, and it becomes really difficult to make generalizations, of course, across um, rural places. Um, rural communities, um, as I'm sure y'all are aware of, um, rural communities are often mis, uh, misportrayed, misunderstood in popular uh, media. So there tend to be two stereotypes that operate um, when we think about rural communities. So one is this kind of Norman Rockwell, rural is sort of this sort of perfect time, uh, very romantic, nostalgic kind of image. The other very different stereotype tends to be rurals at rural places as a source of backwardness, lawlessness. Um, so think of the movie like Deliverance, um, or pretty much pretty much any reality show that's set in a rural place um, kind of uh, capitalizes on that sort of stereotype. Um, so rural communities tend to be very um, misportrayed um, and misunderstood, and often they're overlooked by policymakers and by researchers. Um, Yet, uh, 51 million residents live in rural places. About one in five students is rural. Um, so there's a real need to better understand uh, these rural places, these rural communities, understand why rural schools do matter so much, um, not just for communities meeting their educational needs, um, but also for communities meeting all sorts of other needs as well. Um, and it's that, that's kind of the question that I'm most interested to, um, and is sort of how, how, community, how schools shape communities in all these other kinds of ways. Um, so if we think historically, um, historically the relationship between rural school and rural communities has been close. Um, rural schools have often been very responsive um, to their local communities. Um, they're controlled by a local school board. Um, and they're also, you know, social and cultural centers of their communities. So suppers and recitations and concerts would happen um, in rural schools that would bring the community together. Um, also schools, um, particularly in the South, could serve as a source of racial liberation. So after the Civil War, um, many black communities operated their own rural community schools. Um, they had to do this through basically what amounted to double taxation. Their own tax money went to support white education. Um, so they had to basically tax themselves again. Um, and these schools, even though they were very under-resourced, um, were really important places where um, that promoted skills of literacy, also leadership, um, and this kind of um, liberal arts curriculum that was really tied to racial liberation. Um, and so for that reason too, they were very um, important historically. Um, and we see that more recently, a lot of these um, kind of same themes come up. Um, so we know that rural schools, um, in communities that still have rural schools, they tend to have higher home values and less income inequality. Um, also rural schools um, are really important to kind of maintaining the culture of rural places. Um, and so, that, so we know that rural schools, in a lot of ways, really continue to be um, important to rural, uh, rural places. Um, yet, at times, this relationship seems to have been threatened or appropriated. So in the late 1800s, um, when the country was kind of going through urbanization, industrialization, um, rural outmigration really skyrocketed. Um, and business and political leaders began to worry about the deterioration of rural America. Um, and rural, this is kind of when rural places came to be understood as backwards, um, and so did their schools. Um, there was report after report that was published that documented all of the problems with rural schools. And so, unstandardization, a lack of professionalization, um, basically rural schools being too responsive to their local backwards rural communities. Um, but despite that, rural schools were also seen as kind of a, um, a fix for this problem. And so this kicked off this huge wave of school consolidation and standardization, um, much of which we see um, continuing today. Um, also, schools, rural schools, particularly in the poorest rural communities, continue to be underfunded. 
Um, and this kind of underfunding actually worked to the benefit of a lot of political and economic elite, because basically what it ensured was sort of an undereducated laboring class. Um, and then this went even a step further in many rural black communities, um, where white planters and white industri industrialists really felt threatened um, by black community schools being the source of uh, racial liberation. That was a threat to the racial order. Um, and so what they did was um, they kind of appropriated um, these black community schools, and particularly schools to train teachers. Um, and so instead, what they did was they um, instilled this curriculum of um, uh, farm and factory labor. Um, and this curriculum would instill virtues of docility, obedience, discipline. Um, and these were all skills then that these black teachers would have to perpetuate, you know, would, would carry on into their own classrooms. Um, and so in this way, the, um, the school community relationship, particularly in rural black communities, took on a very different kind of tenor. And now it's about racial control. Um, and we see some of these same themes continuing in some ways today. Um, certainly we see continued consolidation, continued um, standardization, and continued underfunding of rural schools. Um, also, a lot of rural communities now, especially with changing demographics, are wrestling with new race and class-based inequalities. Um, and so this was, it was this kind of paradox, this idea that the relationship between rural schools and rural communities could be quite close and beneficial for rural communities, or in some ways it might really be distancing or undermine the well-being of rural communities. This is what really interested me. Um, and I thought it was really important to understand this better, um, particularly because rural communities are really important to the sustainability of rural towns. Um, and so specifically, I was interested in looking at what roles a rural school plays in a rural town um, and how recent education policies um, have perhaps factored into or shaped that relationship. Um, these kind of questions, they lend themselves really well to qualitative research, so like interview and observation-based research. Um, and specifically for me, um, the method of portraiture. And so portraiture, um, much like a, an artist uh, makes a portrait of a person, portraiture kind of is a, is a portrait of a place or a phenomenon or a person. Um, in my case, as I said, it relied on interview and observation data. Um, and it tends to have a pretty close relationship between researcher and participants. Um, the analysis is really interested in understanding themes and context. So spending time in a place, understanding those kind of contextual details. Um, also, it has an orientation towards strength. Um, which I felt was really important, given a lot of the rural stereotypes out there. Um, strength does not mean perfection, um, and so those kind of imperfections would also be explored, um, but I, it was important to me to go in looking for goodness. Um, and then finally, in the presentation, um, a lot of use of details and stories, and really, like, authenticity is the, the standard of rigor uh, for portraiture. Um, and so uh, th this was the method I used. Um, and my two research sites, um, it could, in, my study encompasses portraits of two rural communities, so Delight and Earl, Arkansas. Um, I don't know how well you can see this. Um, the Delight is down there in the southwest corner. Earl is up there in kind of the Delta region um, of Arkansas here. And I have worked with um, the Rural Community Alliance, which is um, a community organize, organizing group in Arkansas that's really focused on rural sustainability. Um, and they helped me identify uh, two places that wouldn't mind having me hang out for a really long period of time with them and ask a whole bunch of questions. Um, and I really, from day one, I was completely overwhelmed by the generosity of people um, and their openness and willingness to talk about their schools um, and tell me a little bit more about kind of how, what they meant uh, for their communities. Um, both, of, you can see some key details there about both, um, both of the districts, um, both the communities. So both of them were quite poor communities. Um, the, the Delight District, it served a collection of small towns, and together the demographics of those were about 70% white, 30% black. Um, Earl was a little bit larger town, about th uh, 3,000 people, and the demographics were flipped. Um, and there were three schools there. Importantly, both of them were under threat of closure. Um, so for Delight, this was due to consolidation um, for under enrollment or low enrollment. Um, and Earl, it was more about academic sanctions coming down. And so in both places, people were really concerned about the future of their schools and, and their other communities. Um, ultimately, I spent about three years in and out of these places, um, talking to people, sleeping on their couches, um, spending a lot of time there, um, a lot of uh, formal interviews, informal interviews, and then just kind of being a part of the community and going to community events and school events. Um, I saw a lot of proms, a lot of graduations. Um, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to begin to look at each of the communities um, and share some uh, pictures, some quotes, um, a little bit of my own writing as well, um, to give you a better sense of both of them, and then I'll talk about them across. 
um, and then we'll turn uh, turn a little bit more towards me. So. To remind you of Delight's uh, characteristics here, so the town of Delight is quite small, 311 people. Um, it's nearly 100% white. Um, there was literally one black resident, and that's the school's principal, Kathy. Um, but the community, as people would describe it, includes all of the towns in the Delight district. So it's about six <coughs> small towns. Uh, about three of them are mostly white, about three of them are mostly black. Um, and this was once an area of like sawmills and poultry farms, but both of those industries have kind of tanked. Um, and now most people tend to work as truckers, small business owners, and really important um, school employees, okay? Um, and so then thinking about the school here, um, the school district, there's only one school, a K-12 school, the Delight School. And um, as I said, the student body, there's about two-thirds white, about one-third black. Um, and it's important to note that the enrollment there is at 332. Um, and it was about the second year where it was right around 332. And this is important because in Arkansas, there's Act 60. And that stipulates that if you have, if you as a district are under 350 for more than two years, you will be consolidated. So it's a forced consolidation. Um, so they were at that, you know, under 350 for um, for the second year, and so there was a threat of consolidation. Um, and it was both uh, assumed and feared that if they were consolidated, they would go with Murfreesboro, which was a neighboring town. Um, so it was an athletic rival, um, but it was also sort of a political adversary. Um, Murfreesboro, Arkansas has the, um, the country's only diamond mine. That's right. um, <laughs> and so it's kind of seen as the wealthy community, um, and they've got a little bit of a tourism base, and people like routinely find diamonds there. Um, but so there's a little bit of this kind of rivalry between the two places, um, and it was assumed that's where they would um, go if they would be um, consolidated. So my very first trip to Delight, um, my first research trip, um, I was arriving at about 8 o'clock at night. And Kathy, the principal, had told me that I should meet her at, there was a high school basketball game, and I should meet her at the gym. Um, and so I pull into town um, at about 8 o'clock at night, and um, all of the businesses across Main Street are completely dark. And so then I pull into the residential area, completely dark. There's like not a light on in this town. Um, and so I park at Kathy's house, um, she's going to park there, and then I walk over the school, and her house was completely dark. Um, walk over the school, also completely dark. Um, but I can kind of make out, like, you know, the gym um, in, the, um, you know, in the darkness. So I start walking over to the gym, and as I get closer, I begin to hear this kind of hum. And it gets louder and louder as I get closer and closer, and finally I get to the gym doors, and I can see this thin band of light that's slipping out between the gym doors. Um, so I uh, open them up, and that's where everybody was. The entire town was packed into this gym. Um, and this is how I would often experienced a light, um, how it was often described to me, um, as the community hub. Um, as this parent describes here, when you think of delight, you think of the school. That's really where people are a part of delight. And what fascinated me so much was that looking out across the stands, I could see black students and white students, black families and white families, black players and white players all playing together on the same team. This was a place that seemed to have achieved some measure of genuine integration. There was not that like careful line of segregation that defied so many high school gymnasiums. Um, this, like, to at least some degree, um, seemed to be a place where people really got together across race lines. Um, and this is, again, something else I would hear a lot, um, as this parent school board member says here, we're all one family, and we take care of each other. Black, white, whatever, we take care of one another. Um, this question of integration seemed complicated. Um, neighborhoods and churches were still very, very segregated. Um, and so I spent a lot of time like, kind of looking at who was hanging out with who, um, how teachers and parents interacted, um, trying to figure out, like, is this a place that's integrated? Um, and I realized what a tricky question that was sort of as soon as I articulated it. Um, and I'm going to share with you a moment now that um, really resonated with me and that I ultimately wrote about um, that I think reflects to, that, and speaks to some of that, um, that kind of complication. On my last visit, Kathy, the principal, described an interaction she had with a biracial student, a second or third grader, earlier in the week. This little girl had worn to school a shirt with a picture of wide-eyed kittens on the front, and on, on the back, and on the front, a small Confederate flag. The other kids began to whisper and then tease her, though her white classmates wear the same labels. Soon the girl was in Kathy's office, crying and very confused. Kathy told the upset child that it was a nice shirt, a very cute shirt, and asked her if she knew what the flag on the front meant. The girl didn't, and Kathy explained that the flag didn't represent Arkansas and its, people, and its past very well, 
and that it reminded people of the slavery of black people that had happened there in the South. The girl's mother, a white woman, later apologized to Kathy, telling her that she really hadn't noticed the flag when she bought the shirt. And Kathy believes her. The daughter had just liked the kittens that much. Kathy tells me this story as we're talking about race and delight, debating whether race is a problem there. I'm struck by the poignancy of the exchange. Kathy setting aside her own distaste and disgust for the symbol of the Confederate flag to first reassure the little girl that she liked the kittens too, and only then explaining the historical context of slavery and racism, the meaning of the flag, and why others thought it was funny that she was wearing it. This moment between a black principal and a biracial student, playing out against the backdrop of long-standing societal racism, speaks to complicated and complex interactions. This is what the students were telling me, I think, about their relationships. Friendships are usually just friendships, shared by two people of the same race or of different races, but then occasionally, through an ignorant remark or maybe something more intentional, the larger context stands out. Then the casual interactions, the small dramas of personal relationships become colored by generations of racism and colonialism. So I don't think that delight is truly integrated or completely segregated, living in either racial harmony or racial animosity. But I do think that the school forces a certain amount of cross-race interaction and integration. Delight might be closer to integration, not close, but closer, thanks to the school. This seems unusual to me, remarkable, and worth not losing. But there is a threat of loss um, and a fear that um, hangs over delight, and that was that fear of consolidation. Um, I heard all sorts of different iterations of what would happen if they ever lost their school. Um, how basically you're taking the tax base away, you're taking the businesses away, you didn't have anything to hold the kids here, and there's no jobs that are going to bring more into it. It's a dead end, dead end road after the schools go. So basically, how all those little businesses along that strip of Main Street would just kind of disappear, um, the relationships that held light together would suffer, um, and basically how this community would become a ghost town. Um, and interestingly, sadly, even just the threat of consolidation was beginning to fracture the community. Um, Arkansas has a pretty lenient choice policy, so it's pretty easy to choice your children to other districts. Um, and so some parents were already beginning to do that, fearing that consolidation was imminent and worried about the, the, you know, the transition for their children. Um, and there was also um, some confusion, some disagreement about how the community should react to this threat of consolidation. And so those kinds of disagreements were beginning to fracture the community as well. Um, so there was a lot of like fear and uncertainty about all that could be lost with the loss of this school. Um, so kind of stepping back a little bit, as you can probably hear in these snapshots of delight, um, there's a number of themes, a number of things that um, the schools seem to do um, for the community. It certainly provides a common space where people interact. Um, and when they come together in this space, um, there's all these shared activities that help them build relationships and sustain their relationships. Um, the school sustains the town by supporting its economy, certainly through directly employing people, um, but also through supporting the businesses um, along Main Street. Um, it provides a very ready identity for this community. I can't tell you how often I've heard people refer to as bulldogs. Um, but it, it provides a ready identity for the community through shared symbols, traditions, values. Um, it also sets a boundary for who is a part of the community and who is not a part of the community. Um, and then finally, it's uh, forced the community to expand its boundaries. Um, changing its demographics and facilitating something of, a, of an integration. Imperfect, um, but something of an integration. Um, so now I'm going to move towards the other side of the state, um, over to Earl, Arkansas. Um, so Earl, remember, is about three quarters African American, about 25% white, um, and there's really two communities here. Um, and this is how people talked about Earl. There was the white community and the black community, and those two communities were very separate. Um, this is cotton country, um, so it, uh, the town grew up um, in the cotton industry and slave labor, um, and then later around uh, sharecropping. Um, after agriculture declined, specifically the cotton industry declined, the town has never really reco recovered economically, um, and there is a very high poverty rate, um, and there's really a, an economic division in the town that mirrors racial lines. Um, and um, a lot of people feel like things have not much changed in, uh, in Earl. So Earl's story, um, particularly the story of the schools, um, really begins with desegregation, um, as, as the story was related to me. Um, and so uh, the Earl district it remained segregated until 1970. Um, and at that point, the black school, um, which you see a picture of right there, Dunbar, was closed. And the kids were bused um, to the white elementary school and the white high school. 
Uh, now the district includes three schools, um, the elementary, middle, and high, and so back in the 1980s, Dunbar was reopened as the middle school. Um, and it has about 650 students, all of them African American, or nearly all of them African American, and I'll talk a little bit about that transition in just a moment. Um, the perception of these schools, certainly among girls' white families, um, definitely among the media, um, but also increasingly among some of the black community as well, is that the schools are really failing. Um, and the high school really bore the brunt of these assessments. It had failed to make adequate year yearly progress for a number of years. It had just undergone school, res um, yeah, school restructuring, and so the principal had been replaced. Um, a number of teachers had been uh, rehired. And so there was a lot of fear and anxiety about whether or not this place would even stay open um, due to these kind of uh, academic sanctions. Um, and so now taking a bit of a closer look, um, as soon as I began spending time in Earl, I began to hear about that night. Um, and that's the phrase that everybody would use. Um, and so I'm going to share a moment where I found out actually like what happened that night. Um, Mrs. Jessie May Maples sits on a lawn chair on a small stoop just outside her back door, sheltered by the cool shade of a recovered garage. A friend sits with her, and together they gaze across a short driveway, where a few of her daughters stand talking and three granddaughters play. I follow Mrs. Maples inside, her purple-white hair right against the brown of her skin in the darkness of her house, and we sit across from each other at one end of a long dining room table covered by glass candy dishes and punch bowls and neat piles of silverware. Everyone has said I need to talk to Mrs. Maples. She was there that night in 1970, the night the black community marched through Earl, protesting a multitude of discriminatory practices and policies, protesting the likely possibility of unequal treatment in a newly desegregated system. Over her shiny silver, she describes the many injustices leading to that night. Years of old textbooks discarded by the white schools, the rats that came when a landfill was opened up in the black part of town, the fear of hostility because, quote, they didn't want the black up there with them. Finally, she gets to that night, the night of the march, the night she was shot. She's brief. This particular night that I got shot, I was walking right down the street. It wasn't a street then, but it's a street now. We'd marched from down there. It was way down there onto Lincoln Street, I believe. And we'd marched, went uptown and coming back this way, and it was daring us to do everything. So we just decided we were going to march that night, and that's how I got shot that night. I'm surprised by her spare explanation, how quickly she passes over the moment that put her in the hospital for 20 days, that took her spleen, her kidney, part of her pancreas. I want to know more, to understand this night that seems to have shaped a long decade since, to know who is responsible for the shooting. Her answer is immediate, words tumbling. I don't even know, I don't care, I don't know that. She pauses. I never did know. Others had described that night to me too. Several months earlier, I sat in the spacious living room of an elderly white couple, Jane and Brian Speed. Lamplight floods the room and its flowered furniture. Mr. Speed's paintings hang on the wall, and the soft carpet is marked by the tracks of a recent vacuum. Mr. Speed had been the principal of the white elementary school, and then the combined school, during the 60s and 70s. It was terrible here one day, he begins, his thin hands fidgety. They stormed up the street here with guns, and our law officers were out there with their guns. But we had a fire chief. He sounded the fire alarm. Of course, there was no fire, but they left out. I heard this story many times, told in so many voices, in so many living rooms and dining rooms and classrooms. I would notice the pronouns, who was us and who was them, and the many ways that agency and power were tangled in these pronouns. I would also notice the sadness and trauma that seemed to tinge these stories. I would wonder what, that, what the sides were in the battle, and how these battle lines might stretch across schoolhouse doors. I would also wonder what was gained that night, and what was lost. So before that <coughs> night, uh, there were just as many white residents uh, as there were black residents in Earl. Um, but the communities were kept physically apart uh, by the train tracks that ran through town. Desegregation, though, ended up completely changing those demographics, um, because it started a gradual exodus. First, of white children from the schools, then later, white families from the town. Um, and these white families perhaps were motivated to move by the declining economics of the town, or perhaps, um, as I often heard or heard hinted, um, by desegregation itself. So in Earl, desegregation ended up being a complete resegregation of the schools. Um, it also exacted really high costs on the black community, um, because it closed Dunbar for many years. Um, many felt in retaliation for that march. Um, and as the um, current superintendent explains, desegregation was, wasn't a situation where it was a merger. It was a complete shutdown of the black culture because Dunbar had been such an important part, um, such an important part of the town and the community. But 
this story of white flight and economic decline was definitely not the only story I heard in Earl, and perhaps not the uh, most important story. Um, there was also a very different narrative, and one about black political power, and particularly how the power of the town changed hands. So despite the dwindling white population, it was still white families that owned land, that owned businesses, that owned the banks um, in Earl. And um, the black community, though, had a history of protest. Um, and so this is evidence, of course, by the march, um, but also in the 1930s, there had been a series of labor strikes. Um, and so what happened um, as the demographics began to change, um, the black community began to use their vote um, to elect black leaders to positions of power. Um, and perhaps the first and most important one of those was the school board. And so as the school board began to change, um, they began to appoint a black superintendent who hired black principals, who hired black teachers. And so what happened was this really ended up really changing the leadership of the town. And it ended up being a check um, on some of the economic and political control that whites still really had um, in Earl. Um, and the other thing I really heard um, in Earl and about its schools was how the town's future really lies with the schools. And it's only if the um, schools can turn around that businesses are going to be attracted to the area. Um, and the economic fortune of the town was, will really sort of shift. Um, and so that's the big challenge, as his business owner explains. Um, to sell to these kids that there's a big world out there, go out there, get an education, um, but you've got a town here that has a need for so many things, you could be successful right here. We just need to figure out a way to get our kids to come back here and do those things. That's the only hope for our community. Um, and there really was a sort of sense that the schools are the hope. They're, they are the future of this, um, of this community. And if they can turn around, um, if we can get our kids um, to come back here, that's what's going to be the future of Earl. Um, and so as you can probably hear in some of um, what I just shared, um, there's a couple themes here. So the schools are certainly used to maintain the racial segregation of the town. Um, and the schools in the town seem to have this kind of um, relationship um, about decline. Um, both of them are said to be in decline. Um, sometimes the schools were described as partly responsible for Earl's decline, um, particularly by the white community. Other times um, they were more in response. Um, but you, the, the two were linked um, in kind of what was happening there. Um, but again, I also heard these very different kinds of stories um, about political power and about how um, the, the, um, the schools and the leadership that provided was this really important source of voice and agency for the black community, and finally, how they were the source of hope. And you can really sort of see and feel the sense of hope in the schools. Like you walk through the halls, you see all the college pennants, um, and there was this very pervasive um, push towards going to college uh, and then coming back and serving your community. So now stepping back a little bit and thinking about this question of why rural schools matter, looking across um, both of the places, um, there seems to be this important relationship um, between rural schools and, and equity. Um, so we saw in, Delor in Delight how rural schools can bridge racial divides. Um, and they're br bridging racial divides and geographic divides. Um, and Delight seems to be probably for a variety of reasons. One was certainly the leadership of the Delight schools. Um, also, having black residents helped boost the enrollment of the schools, which was certainly a need. Um, and then finally, Delight was um, historically a part of the timber industry. And that was a much more integrated industry than, of course, cotton was. Um, and so that historical context probably mattered there as well. Um, in Earl, um, the schools were certainly used to reinforce racial divides, um, but they were an important source of political power for the black community. And again, sort of a check on the power of the white community. Um, also, in both of these places, the rural schools, they create a community and they define a community. So in Earl, they unify the black community, um, and in Delight, they knit together these six small towns. They do this through different mechanisms. So in Earl, this was really about um, this coming together around this common narrative of struggle and um, you know, struggle for control, for political power. Um, and it's, this narrative outlines both a shared history around this march um, and also a shared future. In Delight, it was much more about relationships and relationships that were sustained through the schools. Um, but then the schools, once they have sort of knitted people together as a community, um, they help sustain this community economically, politically, socially. Um, and then finally, despite the undeniable importance of these schools, um, both of them are threatened by the state. And so the state was a term that I heard over and over and over again in both of the communities. 
Um, it seemed to be a very loose term um, that refers both to um, state officials but also federal officials. Um, basically, lawmakers and policymakers who don't who aren't from here don't understand the value of our rural schools and are making decisions that might threaten their very future and their very viability. Um, in both of these places, um, they fear the loss of their schools, um, either to consolidation or to academic sanction. Um, and these fears really echo two centuries of rural policy making um, and this slow move of control um, from local communities over to the state and to federal entities. Um, and this fear was really profound because there was this worry about everything that could possibly be lost with the loss of the school. Um, no schools, residents feared, no future, no community. And um, I wish I had better news at this point in the story, but the year after I stopped like formally um, doing research in Delight, um, they were consolidated. Um, they were consolidated with Murfreesboro. A year later, they lost their high school, um, and they still have their elementary school right now, but um, it's pretty assumed that the elementary school will be there for much longer. Um, and in Delight, the year after I left, Dunbar was closed again. Um, and so um, we're going to see kind of what this means. What you know, I'm, I'm continuing to follow and stay in touch. Um, but um, yeah, this this proposition here is certainly being tested right now. All right. Um, so what I want to do now is turn a little bit towards Maine. Um, rural schools matter in Arkansas. Um, I would argue they matter a whole lot here in Maine too. Um, and I want to name a few lessons um, that seem particularly key to Maine and your practice um, here in Maine. So uh, the first thing I want to say, the first lesson is about equity um, and how rural schools play really important roles in fostering a more just and equitable society. Um, and Delight, they do this through bridging, um, bridging racial divides and bridging a variety of kinds of divides. Um, and in Earl, though, though these schools were used to reinforce racial divides, they were this really important source of power. Um, and so for that reason, um, in all these kinds of ways, schools are important sources in the pursuit of equity and justice, um, particularly for rural communities. Um, the second lesson I want to call out here is about the link between student well-being and community well-being. Um, I've often heard policymakers and lawmakers kind of oppose the two, um, and oftentimes this is in relationship to consolidation. Okay, so the idea is that if we consolidate, students are going to have more academic opportunities and it's going to be a benefit for them. If we don't consolidate, then the community will keep its school and so it will be a benefit for them. And so what's in students' best interest is kind of pitted against what's in community's best interest. Um, but I think what this um, research shows is that the two are actually quite linked. Um, and it was because students were well cared for, um, because their academic needs were met, um, because they were um, known and nurtured in this environment, and because they knew that their parents had jobs um, and that their community had, had a future. Um, that's why these schools were successful. So these two things, they were not in opposition to one another. This was a place that had small rural schools and really high academic standards. Um, and so I think this is important because it points um, rural school leaders to a, a new way, a way of not seeing these things as actu actu um, actually opposed. Um, and then finally, clearly the schools uh, factored into worries and concerns about the town's future, economically, politically, and socially. Um, also, in light of concerns about outmigration, I was really struck by how <coughs> Earl in particular, there was this real push towards college going. Um, and so this wasn't just, you know, we want our kids to go to college. It was the idea that we want our kids to go to college and we want them to come back here and use those skills here because there is a real need to put those, you know, we need, we need leaders and we need businesses. Um, and so it was kind of a, um, a dual process. It was getting the kids supported, ready to go to college, and also keeping those ties to place so they would come back afterwards and they would use those here. Um, and there was a real understanding that Earl's future as a rural community depended upon its students and its students going to college and then coming back. Um, and that was the focus there. Um, so keeping these three lessons in mind, let's turn a little bit towards Maine now. So a bit of context, um, Maine is the country's most rural state. About 61% of our population is rural. Um, and Maine, like any other state, has its own divisions. Okay? Um, some of these are certainly racial. Um, Maine did not start out 99% white, right? Um, and its native communities are still marginalized in a variety of ways. 
Um, also, Maine's rural demographics are changing. Um, an example of this is in the Millbridge area, where, you know, um, because of the blueberry harvest, um, apple harvest, there's a large number of Latino farm workers, um, and so demographics are rapidly changing. Um, and I don't think that's some anomaly. I think we're going to see more and more of that soon. Um, also, a lot of rural communities have very high poverty rates, um, and particularly in this political moment, there's this threatened social safety net. Um, and in Maine, there is growing income inequality. Okay, so this division here, this, um, this kind of inequality is going to be growing even larger. Um, and there's certainly quite a geographic division in Maine. There's kind of like the urban south and then everywhere else, right? Um, and so Maine does have its own divisions, again, like um, just about every other state. Um, another big challenge here in Maine is an aging population um, and out migration. Maine is the country's, um, not only is it the country's most rural state, it's also the country's graying state. Um, so that's another big challenge uh, here in Maine. Um, and then finally, there's this challenge of uh, college attainment, okay? Um, and so Maine lags behind the U.S. average, both in terms of enrollment in college, and then also college attainment. Um, and so uh, about 56% of high school graduates directly enroll in college compared to 62% nationally. Um, and then if you look at uh, degree attainment, um, there's also a bit of a lag there. Um, so this issue of college going and college attainment is particularly acute uh, here in Maine. Um, but what I want to do is think about these challenges um, in light of the three lessons that I just named before and think about the opportunities this presents um, for rural educators. Um, the state's rural schools are going to play an increasingly important role, um, particularly around equity. Um, because there is a growing community of color in Maine's rural areas, um, for its struggling low-income communities, um, particularly because that division, that economic division is going to be getting even wider. Um, and then just because so much of the state is rural. Um, rural educators, like it's, it, you know, the future of Maine is in your hands. Um, also, the well-being of rural Maine depends upon high quality rural education, which I think, if, we, if you can do that thing that Earl was doing, providing high quality academics and also retaining this sort of tie to place, um, an understanding that expanding rural college access um, and specifically this community to college, back to community pipeline, like that's going to be the future of rural Maine. Um, and I think that's where um, rural Maine sustainability um, really lies. And so I think Maine's future is dependent upon rural students um, and rural schools, and you're the educators that are doing this work. Um, so I'm going to stop there, and um, perhaps we can have some time for questions and things. Um, yeah, thank you. Plenty of time for questions, so please. Um, I don't even think I asked you before, but uh, louder, please louder. Yes, yes, yes keep your voice. Um, I don't think I asked you before, but uh, where did you grow up, and what got you interested in this particular topic? I know you're from down south, but I'm, I'm yeah. Not here. So um, I, well, I was born up north. I moved down south when I was seven. Um, I, as a child, I was a little pissed off about that, so that's why I don't have a southern accent. Um, and so I, I grew up mostly in Louisiana and Georgia. Um, and then I went to college at Dartmouth. Um, and as I, so I, I took an education class. I had not had no desire to be a teacher. Um, I took an education course and kind of loved it. Um, and then um, ended up doing my student teaching in rural Vermont. Um, and I was completely fascinated with I'm in Hanover, New Hampshire. This is a pretty rural place, completely surrounded by all these rural areas, and all we're talking about is urban education. And that disconnect just seems so amazing to me. Um, and so for my placement, um, I asked to get placed in a very rural area. Um, and so I taught in Fairleigh, Vermont, um, which is uh, up on the border uh, between Vermont and New Hampshire. Um, and that's where I got really interested in rural education. Um, and. Again, it was kind of similar to what I experienced then in Bandler, Tennessee, um, and then here in Arkansas, where the schools were such an important source of community. You know, the community was just maintained through this small school building. Um, yet, there were all these divisions and um, divides that the school kind of had to negotiate. Um, and you could see what an important source of, um, of equity um, and what an important role the school could play either in promoting equity or undermining that. Um, and so for me that was kind of 
how I met it. My dad also grew up in rural Indiana, and so I heard all of these stories about um, you know life in a rural place. Um, so that was part of it too. Rural Indiana, whereabouts? Because yep. obviously the race piece, especially the further south you go in Indiana, yeah, I think Marion, Indiana, the Lynchings. So yes. Is, so whereabouts in Indiana? Indiana? Very southern part of Indiana. See, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's, yeah. that's more like a company than it is Indiana. Yes, exactly. Right, right. So yeah, Southern Indiana is basically the South. Mm -hmm. um, and um, and so that's um, and so I think you know there were parts of that that um, began made me also begin to think about race. Um, but I think it wasn't until I was a graduate student that I really began to think about that quite you know much more critically. Um, you know, I've been a white child growing up in the South, and um, at least when I lived in Louisiana, I attended a private school. <coughs> And so for me, thinking about kind of how my own history sort of played into some of the racial divisions as well was really, you know, kind of a mind-blowing experience um, and has shaped a lot of my research questions since then. And, and I hate to keep uh, following up, but Louisiana is such a complex state. Where about Louisiana? Baton Rouge. Baton Rouge, okay. Yeah. yeah. So Florida parishes were just two east. My grandma and my stepdad grew up in Florida parishes. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Experience. So that is going to, and I do mean the, uh, pun. It's going to color your experience yes. very much. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, um, what uh, can you give me some demographics of your private school that you attended? Private school is probably about ninety-five percent white, um, and in Baton Rouge, like in much of the South, basically there's a public-private system that completely mirrors the segregated system, um, and that's perpetuated in all sorts of ways. Um, but. Um, yeah, and I don't think I, like, I didn't think about that critically, of course, as a child growing up in that. And it wasn't only until I kind of re-entered that context as an adult, and you know, oh my God, it was a part of that you know, that segregated system. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's really driven a lot of my questions. But I think it's also interesting some of the nuances you're pointing to um, across regions, because there's certainly this, um, I and mean, particularly in the post-Trump election era, there's been this narrative about like all rural communities are the same. And they're all white, and they all voted for Trump. Um, and that's a very inaccurate um, narrative, um, very complete. And so the, those questions, too, of kind of regional differences and how that matters and shapes schools, I think, is really important. So those are good questions. I, I think there are other questions. Yeah, I'm going to move on, if you don't mind. Scott, can you hand up for a while? Oh, Andrew? Um, yeah, I was, what, what do you feel like would help Maine? Like, what policies need in place to help the rural schools? Because, I mean, there's depending on what rural community you're in, mm -hmm. there's definitely different factors that are causing their schools to fail or, I mean, there's, I was at a, I was at a rural school and we could, we had AmeriCorps grants and we couldn't get AmeriCorps teachers to come, yeah. to come to the school. So, yeah. I mean, it, you can't just throw money at the problem. There's, right. there's, you know, so what, what are some things that you think well, I think um, what, what, you know, whenever I get this question about policy making, um, the first thing I say is that I don't think that just focusing on education, and I'm not suggesting, saying we're suggesting this, but I don't think just focusing on education policies are going to be a solution. Um, I mean, I think broadly these are issues and questions about rural sustainability and like rural health in general. Um, and so just focusing on schools, it's not going to be enough. Um, and so, you know, what you were speaking to just there was also about probably, you know, larger community um, community issues too. Um, and so, I think, you know, our our country's never had a real comprehensive rural growth and sustainability um, set of policies that involve economics, that involve education, that involve um, healthcare, all of those kinds of things together. Um, so first thing I'll say is that I think it needs to be kind of a multi-faceted, multi-factor solution. Um, I mean, some things that I do think are will help is one is this thinking about college going. Um, I do think that getting our kids to go to college um, is, is really necessary in terms of the kind of um, jobs that wouldn't be able to attract here to Maine, um, and also um, some of the equity issues I was talking about as well. Um, that said, there needs to also be jobs for people to come back to. Um, and so then I think it becomes about, you know, what are the kinds of economic policies in place that would attract companies, um, you know, and we think about some of the growing um, industries. So like, you know, IT, thinking about um, alternative energy sources, 
Um, I think Vermont has done a little bit more. I'm quite familiar with uh, the Vermont context as well. And so I think Vermont has done a little bit more in terms of being able to attract some of these businesses. And so we're seeing you know, college graduates return to a lot of very rural Vermont places and because they want to be there. Um, and so I think some of those kinds of marrying those kinds of policies. Um, I mean, in terms of specifically thinking about schools, and I think, I, you know, yes, throwing money at the problem is not the solution, um, but I do think there's a funding issue. Um, I've also just going to say, in terms of what, I'm, what I worry about is this move towards um, pervasive choice, I just don't think is a sustainable model um, for, for Maine. Um, but I, I also agree with your point that I think there needs to be a fair amount of local self-determination because this kind of blanket policy making is going to, you know, it works in some places, it doesn't work in others. Um, it also, you know, creates community buy-in um, when there are local people that have had some sort of hand in creating sort of a set, a more nuanced um, set of policies and also a more nuanced uh, vision of, for, you know, a place's future. Um, yeah, I think those are um, really, really good questions. I think in some in some ways, um, your this response is going to answer the issue that I'm going to raise. Okay. And, uh, it seems to me that there's a paradigm, and I'm probably um, speaking a little bit more as a higher ed person than a K K through 12 person, which I'm not. Um, there's kind of a paradox of schools being an economic anchor of community, yet um, not wanting schools to be treated as businesses. So uh, you, you see, I understand what I'm getting at. So, um, so when we talk, when people um, have this belief that high quality academics is going to be an economic driver for a community, I'll exaggerate just a little bit. I kind of have this vision of myself marching down Main Street in Fort Kent with Plato's Republic, a Picasso, <laughs> a Beethoven <laughs> Symphony, and everyone saying, okay, problem solved, <laughs> uh, which, it's, which it's not. Yeah. Um, and, and so I, I, I just, um, I think the idea of high quality academics as an economic driver in rural communities um, needs to be, the word I used is reinvented. Mm. Um, and, and I don't want to say carefully thought out because to me that, that smacks a little bit too much of academic inertia. <laughs> yeah. um, but it needs to be reinvented because I, I, I think on the one hand, all of us do agree that high quality academics are important, mm -hmm. but how is that going to be um, actualized? And, yeah. and I think, and then again, that's my, my point, I'm sorry for interrupting, but, but I think your previous answer addressed that, that it, yeah. it needs to be much more multifaceted than to just say, well, okay, I'm marching down the street with Shakespeare, there you go. Right, right, and I think also just unpacking what we mean when we say it's important to the economics of the town. And so there's, I mean, there's a variety of ways in which it is important. Um, there's by literally employing people, um, but then there's also about having a high quality school system attracts businesses. Um, and then it's also about, okay, preparing our students well so that then they can um, pursue and attain um, high quality, you know, lucrative jobs. Well, it's also potentially about reinventing a community because if, if, if the academics, if the high quality academics are going to have an impact on a community, they're probably going to um, impact that community in ways that are um, creative, um, innovative, and quite frankly, unimaginable. Yeah. You know, so say for, say for example, I don't know, um, uh, say we can talk about like, uh, you know, alternative forms of energy, renewable energy, whatever, um, IT, those, you know, 30 years ago, uh, those things were probably not, you know, imaginable. Right. So, and, and consequently, I think the ways that the economics could impact rural communities 20 years in the future, but obviously we can't imagine some of those ways right now. So I think <coughs> communities also need to be open. Yeah, and um, I'll say one more thing to this and then I can see a question back there. Um, I think it's also important then to have these conversations about our future as a, you know, a rural town or a rural community, having these uh, conversations more widely than just a few business leaders or the town mayor or the school people. Um, because it requires, I mean, at the very least, buy-in from a lot of people, um, but I also think interesting ideas from a lot of people. Um, and 
I don't, I don't know if this is what you're intending, but I'm hearing a little bit too of how sometimes um, there can be a tension between educators who maybe are trained in very progressive kinds of methods and um, coming in and saying, this is the way I think you should educate your children. Um, and um, I've been in a number of communities of light in particular that is much more traditional sort of mindset about like how we want to do education. Um, and so I wouldn't say one of those visions is necessarily right and the other is wrong. Um, but I would say that that's why having broad conversations across broad constituencies um, and making sure, you know, especially in places that are, um, well, I mean, really anywhere, that these conversations are happening not just among a wealthier elite, um, but are really happening more broadly. Um, that kind of broad conversation needs to precede a lot of these kinds of changes, um, both for buy-in, but also really for the kind of creative ideas um, that can come from that. Thank you. Roger, you have a question? Or who was sending back? I saw it, yeah. Okay, Ro Roger was first, I think. But remember, we only have 10 minutes, Roger. So okay, well, <laughs> one of the things, and I just wanted to throw a little bit of a monkey wrench into that, because what you're saying works at, but if you look at the state of Maine, economic activity stops, I'd say north of Bangor, but along the 95 corridor. In other words, right now, because of the stuff done region, that's on people's consciousness. I'm 95 from there, I basically get to, we are an economic donut hole because of not building roads through Roostick. And if you look at it, take a drive across the border. After 9-11, they shut us off from our most populated areas. I used to go to Canada four or five times a week. Now, maybe once every two or three weeks. And when you drive in Canada, you look at it, the amount of trucks on a Trans-Canada running down from Montreal, Quebec, all the way down, going, to the, but going down below us, coming in at Holton, I see companies hooking up Quebec and Florida, driving right around us, going down. We are an economic donut hole. They chose it that way. and. What complicates things here is you've got all of these little, we're lodged in the Connecticut and Rhode Island put together. We've got less than 70,000 people, which is smaller than anyone in a small town. So it, you know, it's like a suburb of Portland. Portland is closer to New York City than it is to Fort Kent. And people forget about this as far as it, when you get to work, we're representing things If you look at, we've, we're at the tail end of, oh my God, 70 years of economic malpractice well, in terms of what they've done to Aroostook County. And if you think the school's going to fix that, it's got to be a part of it. But there is it's some serious, serious problems we're facing. And I, I, I encourage you to run for public office. <laughs> <laughs> because there's things to be happening on multiple levels. I and I think you named, um, you know, there's, there's a school component of this, um, there's a political component of this, and there's an economic component of this. And doing any one of those, I completely hear your point, doing any one of those in isolation of the others is a dead end road. Um, and so I think it needs to be much more comprehensive um, than just thinking about schools. Okay, Tony and Kai. Yeah. I was wondering if you could give us a quick overview of what the research and literature says about the early college education programs that are populating throughout the United States. Yeah. Um, so I don't know that much about specifically early, um, these early college, like the dual enrollment kind of programs. <clears throat> I know that they're a, a good, um, and you could probably speak to some of the research better than I could, um, but I know that they are a good indicator of um, going on to college um, and persistence in college. Um, broadly, the most important indicator of whether or not a student will persist in college is academic preparation. Um, so anything that can get kids um, uh, feeling not just feeling, being academically prepared um, will help in that pursuit. Um, I also think some of the most innovative programs that really um, get kids on college campuses um, also are really unique um, because they can help with that sort of social transition aspect. Um, and, uh, you know, I mean, so I do have this new research project that's looking at the high school to college transitions and then experiences of rural first-gen students. Um, and in doing that, I've been out talking to um, high school counselors, um, admissions people, uh, college admissions people, and community-based organizations. 
And what I'm really struck by is how it's like there is high school, and, or K-12, and then there is college, and there's this huge gulf in between. And no one's really packing, picking up the slack there. Um, and so, um, I mean, I think I think the most innovative work is really happening with a lot of community-based organizations that are picking up the slack, um, or programs like this that are really in very intentional ways trying to line those up so that it's not the kid that is sort of forced to, you know, jump that divide by themselves, um, but they've got a real scaffolded process there. Um, and so, you know, broadly, I do think that. K-12 education and college need to be brought into closer alignment. Um, and any ways that that can be done is going to be beneficial um, for students. And I don't know if you want to say. Well, you, you, you hit the two major points. Um, all the re I've looked at a lot of the research related to early college dual enrollment. And they usually focus on attainment and retention. And while you know it has, it has a direct effect on attainment, of course, uh, but more so on retention. Um, so students who, who have participated in some version of an early college, pre-college program, dual enrollment, et cetera, tend to persist longer into graduation um, in college than students who don't. So even students at the same academic level, for example, student A who does nothing except go to high school and does not do early college, student B, even if they're both very strong students, student B who does the early college program will tend to stay in college to graduation um, more often. And that's, that's been pretty much across the board in all the research out there. And um, go ahead. Yeah, um, one other thing that's been striking to me is there, you know, there has been this kind of push towards college um, in recent years. I don't think there's been a much, um, I don't think there's been enough attention to keeping kids in college yeah. so that they actually attain a degree. Um, and so I think that's kind of the next level of work. Um, and so there are, um, you know, I think dual enrollment is interesting because it has that longer term, you know, impact. And that's what really matters. Um, it's, uh, maybe, you know, college doesn't amount to much if you don't get the degree. Um, and actually, I found that it can have um, a negative, like, going to college and then leaving can have a negative community impact um, because that kid that has then left college goes back to his community and was like, look, I'm coming home with, you know, tens of thousand dollars worth of debt. I don't have a degree. I had an awful experience. Go, go. Um, and so I think this the retention issue is really, really important, and I'm hoping that we get more money and also more research and also more like policies looking at that piece, um, because otherwise I think it's going to have um, the, the blind push towards college can have some really perverse effects. Thank you. Hi, who's next? Um, I just want to go back to what you were talking about schools being part of the economic foundation of the community. Mm -hmm. When you were researching in Arkansas, mm -hmm. how did you find the community felt towards their schools? Because obviously Arkansas probably had not like you do. Mm -hmm. um, and we have to marry the businesses with the, with the people and the schools for this grassroots effort to bring the kids back to our schools and, and to properly fund our schools. But we are running through this roadblock of I don't want my taxes to go up, I don't want my taxes to go up, I don't want my taxes. Yeah. How was it in Arkansas? How did people feel about funding their schools? Um, that's a great question. Um, and it was, I would say it was mixed, um, particularly Earl, um, which it taxed itself as one of the highest rates um, in the state. But because it's based on property taxes and it was a property poor area, it got very little for those taxes. Um, so, I mean, I would say my first point is just that it speaks to the underlying inequality of how we fund our schools um, and how we structure inequality into our schools um, in a very deliberate sort of way. Um, I think Maine's got a particular challenge because of the grayness of the population. Um, and so a lot of the taxpayers don't, aren't directly implicated in the schools. Um, and so I think that then becomes um, a bit of a paradox. And then, so then it becomes this issue of selling to communities um, why having a school is not just in the benefit of those with children in the school, but it can have all of these other sorts of effects as well. Um, one thing that I think both schools did really, really well is that the schools were centers, social centers of the community, regardless of whether or not you had kids there. Um, and so this was the place like Delight in particular, it was um, like this kind of patchwork of 14 little buildings all on a block. Um, and so 
the um, area around the school was used as a walking path. And so there was always this group of ladies that were sort of speed walking around the school. Um, in Earl, I can't tell you how many times um, I'd be sitting in the front office and somebody would come in and need to use a fax machine. And not for any school business, they just needed to send a fax to somebody. And so the, um, the leadership in both schools had really made this very deliberate effort to make sure the school was an inclusive place, um, particularly for all ages. Um, and I, I think that's one very directly transferable sort of lesson um, because people felt very emotionally anchored um, to both of those places. And so then when it came, you know, kind of push came to shove and it was time to raise taxes, um, they were much more willing to support that, I think, um, because they saw those kinds of benefits, um, particularly socially. I have time one more question, Gary. Yeah, you know. oh. uh, my question was about. Um, I think maybe another part of this might be the connection with businesses. Um, and you know, Brewster County's got the partnership going, at least in, in Central Brewster, to try to get um, business leaders into schools and to talk to kids before they go off to college about training. I wonder if you found anything like that in any of your work as well. Yeah, I didn't see that. Um, <coughs> both both Earl and Delight had a pretty um, uh, what's um, expansive career and tech ed programs. Um, and there were some internships and things like that through there. Um, I don't think they had done really pervasive, um, you know, let's build concrete partnerships. Um, but I do think those could be really promising. Um, I think there have become issues of control. And so, you know, kind of who is cur cur uh, curricular control and those kinds of questions. Um, but I think it can, you know, be a boon on both sides, um, particularly for students um, doing internships, summer placements, job shadows, um, and and that can really help that you know community to college back to community. If you know you're coming back and that you've got um, you know employment options, or you can even just sort of picture yourself in that context, um, that really helps in, in that kind of um, in that kind of way. Um, and the other thing I'll uh, I'll just mention too is that um, one thing that's really important for college going is having mentors that have completed college. Um, and so businesses might also be a source for that as well. Great question. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Mara. Absolutely. Thank you.